G'day, eh? My name's RJ. This is Killer Canuck, and together, we're looking through Canada's horror history. After his undisputed but controversial success with Shivers in 1975, David Cronenberg was ready to keep the ball rolling on his career. Dunning, Link, and Reitman were all eager and excited to support him, but the CFTC was hesitant after the PR nightmare they had just gone through. Lucky for everyone, the executive director of the CFTC at that time was a man named Michael Spencer, and he recognized Cronenberg's talent. Spencer, who was hired by John Grierson to work for the National Film Board as Director of Planning, is unofficially credited as being the architect of the Canadian Film Development Corporation, and was named as its first executive director. Over his 10-year stint from 1969 to 1979, he oversaw the funding of several cardinal Canadian classics, such as Ted Kotcheff's The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, and Don Shabib's Going Down the Road, which was written by Death Weekend director William Fruitt. It was under him that the CFTC relented and funded Shivers, and it would be under him that they would fund Cronenberg's next picture, Rabid. After Cronenberg's landlady kicked him out of his Kensington apartment when she learned that he was responsible for Shivers, John Dunning put him up in his summer home in the country outside of Montreal to write. Originally titled Mosquito, Cronenberg got to work on the script for Rabid, though recalls that he leaned heavily on Dunning and Reitman near the completion of it for support, fearing that everyone would laugh at it. Operating as a sort of companion piece to Shivers, Rabbit delivers a similar concept and ups the ante from an apartment building to an entire city. The CFTC provided $200,000 of the $530,000 budget, and they cross-collateralized the funding with a movie that was to be called Convoy, which ultimately fell through. Rabbit, released in 1977, opens with a couple, Rose and Hart, out driving on their motorcycle in the Quebec countryside, looking for a place to happen, making stops along the way. Hart is played by Newfie actor Frank Moore, and Rose is played by Marilyn Chambers, a household name at that time for having starred in the porno chic film Behind the Green Door in 1972. The one-time face of Ivory Snow Soap, until the company learned about her filmography, Chambers was looking to break from the X-rated scene and trying to make it as a legitimate actress. Chambers was not Cronenberg's first pick. He wanted Sissy Spacek after seeing her in Terrence Malick's Badlands in 1973, but Cinepix weren't keen on her freckles and Texas accent. Ivan Reitman met with Chambers after seeing her carry herself very well in an interview on Late Night Cable, thinking that the casting of a porn star would catch the eye of worldwide distributors. While it's uncertain whether Spacek would have taken the part, just before Rabbit went to camera saw the release of Brian De Palma's Carrie in 1976, making her a household name among horror fans, and would have made her a massive get for Cinepix. A terrible three-point turn and a lead foot causes the motorcycle to fly off the road, launching hard and landing on Rose's abdomen before exploding. This explosion is witnessed by patients at the Keloid Plastic Surgery Clinic just down the road, run by who else? Dr. Dan Keloid. I just sure as hell don't want to become the Colonel Sanders of plastic surgery. Played by Canadian actor Howard Reichpan. Dr. Keloid's name is a pun on keloid, which is a medical term for scar tissue. They rip out to the scene of the accident in their wicked lime green ambulance. Hart has suffered minor injuries and can be sent to the hospital, but Rose's injuries are far too severe, and she will not survive the three-hour trip to the closest hospital in Montreal, so they bring her back to the clinic to operate on her there. The clinic, whose lobby was actually the headquarters of Lipton Tea, sees a cameo from Cronenberg collaborator Ronald Mlodzik. You think they could cover it with a sheet or something? Rose's abdomen and intestines have been so badly damaged that Dr. Kelwood resorts to an experimental surgery to save her life. He implements what he calls neutral field tissue taking a graft from her thigh and neutralizing it so that they can use it on her intestines in the hopes that they will grow and repair themselves on their own. Sort of like stem cells. David Cronenberg watched a plastic surgeon for three hours to prepare for this scene. The operation is a success, but it puts Rose in a coma. Hart gets driven to the hospital by Murray Cipher, played by returning Shivers actor Joe Silver. A full month passes before Rose wakes up screaming one night. She is tended to by Lloyd, a patient at the clinic recovering from a facelift, who is played by Canadian actor Roger Perriar. He calms her down and she gets uncomfortably physical with him. Now uh, look, this is really weird. She wraps her arms around him and he starts to yell in pain before we see blood pouring from his midriff. He gets examined by Dr. Keloid, saying that he doesn't remember the attack, but that his entire right side is numb. Keloid takes a blood sample before sending Lloyd to the hospital. Rose has fallen back unconscious and Dr. Keloid checks the graphs, seeing that they're healing well. Later that night, Rose wakes again. She steals a coat and heads out into the dark 1970s Quebec countryside, stopping at a barn. She cuddles up close to a cow laying in the hay and gives it a bit of a side hug for a moment, before throwing up blood. The owner of the barn returns, drunk, and threateningly approaches Rose. She defends herself by throwing the armpit at him, and escapes while he rolls on the ground in pain. She returns to the clinic and tries to call Hart, but he doesn't answer. He's in the garage working on his totaled bike, and listening to Marilyn Chambers' song Benny Hanna on the radio. This disconnect between Hart and Rose is a running theme throughout the film. They have a few near misses and communicate mostly through the phone something that Cronenberg predicted accurately about the future. Lloyd packs up to leave the hospital, looking like he maybe shouldn't be in such a rush to do so. His roommate, a true Canadian, 
offers to cover for him. Night nurse comes around, I'll, I'll tell her you're in a can, eh? This is actor Bob Silverman, who would return for Cronenberg in Scanners in 1981 and Naked Lunch in 1991. He takes a cab back to the Keloid Clinic. The cab, however, is driven by Marcel Fournier, so we know right away that they aren't going to make it. Lloyd takes a hearty bite out of the driver, and the pair participate in a spectacular car stunt before being plowed into by a truck traveling through the underpass. David Cronenberg operated one of the cameras during this scene using a telephoto lens. As the car slid towards him, he thought, wow, that looks pretty close. And when he stepped back, he realized that the car stopped mere feet from him. Any farther would have taken out both him and the camera. Rose calls Hart again, and this time he answers. She asks him to come and get her. Hart, whose means of transportation is currently in pieces, calls Murray for a lift. He's watching a Cinepix classic, Across the Land with Stomp and Tom Connors. Murray agrees to drive him. Dr. Kelloy checks on Rose's graphs and finds that she has a new, uh, orifice in her armpit and that it's home to a new, uh, phallus. The neutrophil tissue graphs that Dr. Kelloy used in Rose's surgery affected her in a way that no one anticipated. Because Rose only has a small section of intestines left, she can't properly digest food. So the graphs evolved to support the body themselves, operating similarly to a vampire bat, surviving solely on the blood of others, specifically human blood. Kelloid gives Rose a hug and support, and she responds affectionately by jabbing him in the abdomen with her underarm graboid. The farmer that attacked Rose earlier, or rather the farmer that got attacked by Rose earlier, stops into a diner. Did you know you're bleeding? He goes on a rabid rampage and attacks the waitress. Dr. Kelloid scrubs in to perform surgery. He shakily stitches his patient before asking the other doctor for the scissors. She hands him them and he chops her finger off and sucks the blood pouring out before moving on to attack the anesthesiologist. During the ensuing chaos, Rose steals clothes and sneaks out of the clinic. Hart and Murray arrive at the clinic, which is now occupied by the police. Hart asks around for Rose, but the police tell him that she isn't there. Murray cooperates with the police, who introduce him to the now rabid Dr. Kelloid. <laughs> The pair are brought to the police station where they're forced to quarantine, not for 14 days, but at least overnight. Rose hitchhikes with a truck driver named Smooth Eddie, played by Canadian actor Gary McKeon, who would return for Cronenberg in The Brood in 1979. He offers her a beef sandwich, which her body promptly rejects. He does eventually feed her something she can keep down, and the truck is found pulled over on the side of the road. The truck is approached by a cop played by another Cronenberg alumni, Jack Messenger, who was in Stereo and Crimes of the Future, and would return in Scanners and The Dead Zone. Quebec Bureau of Health official, the very Quebecois Claude Lapointe, played by Montreal actor Victor Daisy, who, like practically everyone else in this film, would return for a role in Scanners, informs the viewer that the virus seems to be a strain of rabies, and that there is currently no cure. He asks citizens to socially distance themselves from the saliva of others, because that's how the virus spreads. Don't let uh, anybody bite you. Smooth Eddie's boss asks around for him. Before, it didn't look too good. What do you mean he didn't look too good? Smooth Eddie always looks good. Before looking for him in the back. Smooth Eddie attacks his boss and reminds another employee that he knows what he did last summer, before being taken down. In quarantine, Hart calls his and Rose's good friend Mindy, asking if she's heard from Rose, and Mindy responds that Rose is actually on her way over. Now with a destination, Hart needs only wait for the quarantine to lift before he can finally be reunited with his girlfriend. While waiting, he, Murray, and the chief of police are attacked by an officer who's been infected with the rabies virus, before he's quickly dispatched with a shotgun. Rose arrives at Mindy's place, and promptly leaves. She roams the street in an iconic fur coat, looking for someone on which to feed. She subconsciously decides that if she has to feed on people, then she's going to feed on people who might be more deserving, and stops into The Eve, a porno theater playing such classics as Models for Pleasure and Party Swapers. She's in there not even 103 seconds before she's harassed by one of the patrons. She coyly tells him that she likes coming to these types of movies, but that strange men always come up and bother her. Not taking the hint to his own detriment, the man offers to sit with her to protect her from said strange men. The predator quickly becomes the prey when he reaches into her blouse. Rose leaves the theater and heads back to Mindy's place, passing a cheeky carry poster on the way. The next morning, Mindy bids adieu to a writhing Rose and gets aboard a subway car full of curious extras. There she bears witness to a rabies attack. Mondays, am I right? In response to the growing pandemic, the city of Montreal is put under martial law and armed soldiers take to the streets. This is a direct homage to the October crisis and it's no coincidence that this doctor looks and talks like Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Shooting down the victims is as good a way of handling them as, as we have got. For those of you unfamiliar with the history of the October Crisis, the Front de Libération du Québec, or the FLQ, were a separatist terrorist group who kidnapped and subsequently murdered Deputy Premier Pierre Laporte in October of 1970. This prompted then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau to invoke the use of the War Measures Act, the only ever use of it during peacetime, to deal with the separatist threat. 
Marilyn Chambers as a character is actually named after two of the FLQ kidnappers, brothers Paul and Jacques Rose. With their overnight quarantine lifted, Hart and Murray head out for Mindy's place. Rose's hunger pangs lead her to the mall. She's in there not even 74 seconds when she's harassed by... <laughs> wow, what an outfit. Sure is nice, eh, Christmas? Her buffoon quarter doesn't even have a light for the cigarette he offered her, and when he goes to get one, I definitely practice that cool guy walk, he's attacked by a man who was attacked on the subway. The rabid subway patron is run down by one of the armed guards who uses his Red Rider machine gun to shoot his, and sadly Santa's eye out. Hart and Murray finally arrive in Montreal in the midst of the chaos in the streets. Murray asks Hart to drop him off at his house to check on his wife before he goes to find Rose. Hart obliges and Murray searches his home for his wife and child. This type of horror in the home was still uncommon in Canada in 1977, and the imagery of the bloody bassinet is pretty stark. Murray is ultimately done in by his rabid wife, who was hanging out in the closet for some reason. Hart makes his way timidly through the streets of Montreal, sneaking a peek at the Canadad's Canadad cameo on the hood of a car. He arrives at Mindy's place but is too late, opening the door to Rose mid-feed on their friend. He concludes that Rose has been the typhoid Mary of this whole epidemic, and the two get into a screaming match. You carry the plague! You've killed hundreds of people! It all boils over with Rose accidentally knocking Hart down the stairs and hitting his head, rendering him unconscious. Rose heads down to the lobby. Rose heads down to the lobby. Rose heads down to the lobby, and comes across a man reading the newspaper. This man is played by filmmaker Alan Moyle, who would go on to direct several films through the 90s and 2000s, such as Pump Up the Volume and New Waterford Girl. Hart comes to and heads back to Mindy's apartment, where he receives a call from Rose. She explains to him that she's going to prove that she isn't to blame for the deaths of all those people. She has fed on the man she brought upstairs and intends to sit with him to make sure that he doesn't show any signs of rabies. Hart begs her to leave, telling her that what she's doing is suicide. She tries to comfort him, but as her rabid machination lumbers toward her, the lion goes dead and Hart screams and smashes the phone to pieces, a bitter end to a fruitless chase. William Beard, author of The Artist as Monster, the cinema of David Cronenberg, calls Hart a true Canadian hero insofar as he's completely ineffective. He literally does nothing the entire movie other than get two concussions and talk on the phone. He doesn't even drive himself most of the time. The film concludes with Rose's body being unceremoniously thrown in the back of a garbage truck. Just another one for the pile in the wake of the epidemic. Rabbit has that distinct Cronenbergian quality of being sexual without being sexy. Would the movie have been better with Sissy Spacek in the lead? Probably in some ways, but the casting of Marilyn Chambers gives it something different. She plays the role with the innocent girl next door naivete that's required, but with the hovering audience knowledge of behind the green door present in every frame. Cronenberg thought she performed well and always wondered why she never went on to do more straight films. Rabbit would be Cronenberg's last film with Cinepix. His next movie would be 1979's Fast Company, the outlier in his filmography as far as genre is concerned, but focusing on another of Cronenberg's passions, cars, motorcycles, and racing. Working on Fast Company, he would meet cinematographer Mark Irwin, with whom he would work until 1988's Dead Ringers, on which he would utilize Peter Suchitsky, who has been behind the camera for Cronenberg ever since. He also met Carol Spire, who would collaborate on almost all of Cronenberg's work, first as an art director and then as a production designer starting with Dead Ringers. And finally, he met Ronald Sanders, who has since been his career-long editor. 1979 would also see the release of The Brood, Cronenberg's most personal film, and one that helps balance the lack of horror present in Fast Company. 2019 saw the first ever remake of one of David Cronenberg's works, Rabid, directed by iconic Canadian horror twins Jen and Sylvia Soska. I'm surprised it took this long for someone to give his work another crack, but it is refreshing to see that it was done by fellow Canadians. A modern take on Cronenberg's work from a very different set of eyes. I'll be looking at the two films side by side next time. And until then, I've been RJ, this has been Killer Canuck, and thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Canadian Horror History. If you liked what you saw, be sure to drop me a like and hit the subscribe button. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RealKillerCanuck. If you like the tune playing in the background, be sure to check out Prod Uji on SoundCloud and over at NoiseRecords.com. I'll leave a link in the description below. Who's your favorite Canadian band? Let me know in the comment section. Until next time.